Good afternoon. On behalf of Secretary Richard Carlson, I'd like to welcome you to our Put the Brakes on Fatalities event. I'm Chris Bortz, the Traffic Safety Manager at KDOT. Once again, we're here to celebrate Put the Brakes on Fatalities Day. It was actually today, October 10th. This national safety campaign focused on all types of traffic safety, whether you're traveling by car, truck, bus, motorcycle, bicycle, or even walking. The goal is for you to get safely to where you are going, and age doesn't matter, from a baby in a child passenger seat, to a teen driving for the first time, to a senior driving for the millionth time. Every person plays a part in this traffic safety effort. Nearly 95% of all traffic fatalities are due to driver error. Put the brakes on Fatalities Day also highlights improving driver behavior, whether it be distracted driving, driving while impaired, speeding, not obeying traffic laws, not wearing seat belts or protective gear. It's all part of the big picture to arrive alive. With 461 traffic fatalities in Kansas in 2017, and an average of 37,000 traffic fatalities a year across the U.S. That shows we have a lot of work to do, and it's something we must work on together. Each one of us has to take responsibility every time we travel for our actions, our passengers, and ourselves. And step by step, we can keep working towards reducing traffic fatalities on that road to zero. The first thing everyone should do when they get in the vehicle is buckle up. Our first speaker today, WIBW TV anchor Chris Fisher knows this all too well. Once again, Chris, please, we are excited that you're here today and sharing your story with us. Lovely day for a press conference, isn't it? <laughs> that wasn't at you, Kim, I promise. <laughs> it's our weather guy's fault, I think. It's he, he's the one that had us outside today. Uh, well, thanks for taking the time to uh, listen today. We all know somebody who just won't wear their seatbelt, don't we? Statistics, logic, irrefutable evidence. There is nothing that you can do, you can show or say to get that person to change their mind. Absolutely nothing. And one of those people, he was my dad. He died February the 12th, a day after his 60th birthday in a rollover accident. It was an accident that would, he would have undoubtedly walked away from had he only been wearing his seatbelt. But he wasn't. He never did. I told myself I was going to read fast through this. It was a Monday morning around 1030. He was hauling a load of sand to a job site that day. Nothing too out of the ordinary for my dad. That sand would never make it to its intended destination. We don't know why, but as he was getting off one highway to merge onto another, he veered off the road to the left and overcorrected to the right and then overcorrected to the left again. With a swift jerk of the wheel, that put his truck into a roll. Two and a half tumbles later, a small group of passerbys gathered around my father's lifeless body. He was ejected out of the driver's side window. I remember going to see him at the funeral home a few days later. There was a large blanket wrapped around his head in an attempt to cover up the point of impact. A team of doctors and nurses fought hard to keep him alive for almost two hours, but in the end, the damage was too great. His cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. By 1.30 that afternoon, two state troopers were at my mom's doorstep to relay the horrible news. I remember walking into the house and seeing her curled up in a chair in the far corner of the living room, rocking back and forth, crying uncontrollably and crushed beyond belief. I remember seeing my dad's lunch pail. It was still by the door. There was a Gatorade and a pack of crackers sitting inside. His reading glasses were on top of yesterday's paper on the coffee table next to his favorite spot on the couch. It was surreal to think that just a few hours before he was in that house sliding across the heart of this cotton that he was never ever coming back i didn't think that the feeling could get any worse in the hours after that crash i thought to myself that right then and there was rock bottom but it certainly wasn't i hit rock bottom a day later when my brother his wife my girlfriend and i went to the salvage yard to collect what belongings remained in his tattered truck 
Like everybody, I was expecting to see a mangled mass of metal crumpled up, tangled, and barely recognizable, and I couldn't have been more wrong. A man emerged from the back office as we were inside letting the receptionist know what we were doing there, and as the woman behind the desk handed us his keys, he calmly, calmly and optimistically walked by and asked, how's he doing? Well, he's dead, I said. The room fell silent as he offered his condolences and we walked back outside towards the wreckage. And with each step, my heart sank deeper and deeper into my chest. I knew my dad was in a rollover. I knew he was ejected. I knew that he wasn't wearing a seatbelt, but I was not prepared to see what I did. There were obvious dents and dings, and the back windshield was knocked out, but the structure of the cab was intact. It didn't even come close to looking like a truck that had been involved in a fatal accident, not even by a little. Had my father been wearing his seatbelt, he wouldn't have even had to climb out the window because both doors still opened. But that wasn't the case. And that is why I'm here today. I'm here to share the story of my family's tragedy in the hopes that one person, just one person, listens to what I have to say. Losing my dad has been hard on the entire family, but it's taken its biggest toll on my mother. While there was nothing I could do or say to change my dad's mind on seatbelts while he was alive, had he been able to see how this accident absolutely and unbelievable crushed his wife of 37 years, I promise you that he would have walked away from that rollover because he would have been wearing a seatbelt. But he can't see that. I can't go back in time. I can't. I can look in the future, though, in hopes that this tragedy and that his death are not in vain. My son talks about his grandpa a lot. He especially loves to tell me about the fun adventures just the two of them had out on the farm. After a story or two, the conversation tends to stop, and out of the corner of my eye, I can see him wiping a tear or two out of his. The second that my two-year-old nephew would step inside my mom and dad's house, he'd run straight to the couch where my dad would always sit. I cannot tell you how heartbreaking it was to see him turn that corner and find nobody there. People say that it's their choice whether or not they wear a seatbelt, and they have the right to make their mind up and choose that. And they're exactly right. It is their choice in the end. But what will that choice have on your spouse, your kids, your grandkids, if, your family and friends, if they find themselves in the same shoes as mine? How will your husband or wife react when a state trooper shows up on your front porch? How will your children feel when they pick up the phone and hear their mother on the other line telling them as she gasps for air and sobbing uncontrollably that their dad was gone? What kind of impact will your death have your family knowing that you didn't have to die? How something as simple as buckling up and wearing a seatbelt could have saved your life? Unfortunately, I know the answers to all of those questions all too well. I've read every report, document, and detail pertaining to his crash. I know exactly where, when, and how it happened. I know the exact spot on the highway where he landed. What I don't know, and I think about all the time, is what was going through his mind that moment that he knew he was in trouble. What happened inside that truck as the accident was unfolding? I visualize that crash over a thousand times in my head, each time it plays out just a little bit differently. Did he try to catch or brace himself? Did he try to hold on to the steering wheel? Did he wish he was wearing a seatbelt? The answers to those questions died with him that day. Nothing anybody could have said could get my dad to wear a seatbelt, and that ended up costing him his life. It cost my mom her husband. It cost me and my brother our dad. It cost his four grandkids their papa. We are all just a single distraction away from finding ourselves in a similar situation. We never think it'll happen to us, but someday it could. Please buckle up.
Thank you, Chris. We're very sorry for your loss. It really emphasizes the fact of in one split second, you just never know. So you got to do everything you can to prepare all the time. Lisa Razor is an avid bicyclist. She wears a helmet every time, and it's a good thing. Please welcome Lisa is going to tell us more about her story. Lisa? Okay, can you hear me all right? Hi, my name is Lisa Razor, and I'm a litigation paralegal for KDOT's Office of Chief Counsel. I have been a long-distance bicyclist um, since 1995. I ride on state highways, county roads, gravel roads, and trails. My favorite vacation is taking a week to bicycle across Kansas every year. It's really the best way to see our state. I have always worn a helmet when I ride. It's like wearing a seatbelt. Most of the time, nothing happens while you're wearing it. But sometimes something does happen, and wearing it saves your life. I was biking the Shunga Trail just a couple miles from here a few years ago. I was going pretty fast around some of the curves, and I misjudged one of them. I hit the railing on the outer edge of the trail and flew off my bike. I hit the ground hard and scraped up my legs and left elbow. The bike was pretty messed up too. When I took off my helmet afterwards, I saw that the outer shell of the helmet was scraped up and cracked. I wasn't even aware that I had hit my head during the crash because my helmet did its job and absorbed the impact. Without a helmet, it would have been my skull that was cracked. It was the worst bike wreck I had ever been in, but I walked away with it walked away from it with just a few bruises. All those years of wearing my bike, bike helmet until it became a habit, it's totally worth it. Thank you. Once again, thank you, Lisa, for a great reminder about wearing protective gear. Jackie Tears is from Great Bend and has a difficult story to tell, but Jackie is adamant about sharing what she has gone through because she doesn't want it to happen to any other family. Please welcome Jackie. Good afternoon, I'm Jackie Tears. Less than five months ago, on May 26, 2000, 2018, I lost my 22 year old daughter Danielle to a car wreck. As I found out a few days later, she was texting and driving when she ran into the back of a semi going 65 miles an hour. She didn't break. She simply never saw the semi because she was distracted by her phone. She leaves behind a three-year-old son, Jace, who doesn't understand where his mommy is or why she's sleeping in that bed, which is her coffin. On the morning of the accident, I heard the sirens, and I began praying for whoever was involved. A few minutes later, I received a message from her co-worker saying Danielle hadn't made it to work. I called her phone twice with no answer, and then I messaged her babysitter, who informed me that Danielle had told her that Jace's other grandmother was picking him up that morning instead. That's when I knew it was Danielle in that accident. The highway patrol called and confirmed that it was her and they were taking her to a local hospital. I arrived as they were taking her out of the ambulance. And she looked at me and she said, Mom, it hurts so bad. My stomach hurts so bad. I got to tell her I love her. I loved her and squeezed her hand before she went out again. And they loaded her into the helicopter and they flew her to Wichita. Upon arrival in Wichita, they did a full body scan and discovered internal bleeding and took her immediately to surgery. After several hours, the chaplain came in to our private waiting room and advised us that the surgeons would be in soon, and then she sat down. I remember looking over at her face and I knew it wasn't good. 
I knew she didn't make it, although I wanted to believe I was wrong. The surgeons came in a few minutes later and told us there were four of them working on her, and she fought hard. Then they looked me straight in the eye and said, we are sorry, but your daughter died. My whole, my whole world is shattered. As we prepared for her funeral, the pastor asked us if we'd be willing to share during Danielle's service on how she died in hopes to maybe save anyone in attendance from texting and driving. He promised to present it in a tactful way. We agreed, we agreed to allow him to do this. During her service, he asked everyone to turn on their phones and go to his Facebook page and share a picture he created for Danielle to encourage people to put their phones down while driving. That picture is entitled Do It For Danielle. And we have since created a Facebook page to share our story and, and stories of others who have been affected by distracted driving. It has since been put on my heart to share with everyone I can the, distraction, the dangers of distracted driving. Statistics show that the average time it takes to read or send a text message is 4.6 seconds. In 4.6 seconds at highway speeds, 55 miles an hour, a vehicle can travel the distance of a football field. 4.6 seconds. It doesn't have to be a text. It can, or it can be a phone call or any kind of distraction that takes your eyes off the road for that amount of time. Maybe your purse fell to the ground and you reached for it. Maybe you have a child or a grandchild in the back seat causing a commotion. 4.6 seconds of any distraction can cost you your life or the life of another. It's just not worth it. Please pull over if there's something that is that important that needs your attention. Several people have told me or written me that they have committed to never texting and driving again. And I hope more people t will make that same commitment each day. It's been hard, t but telling our story is worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I'm confident your story has made a huge impact, and I'm glad people are putting their phones down while driving now because of your story. Chris, Lisa, and Jackie, and other people across Kansas were a part of a traffic safety blog series, and they shared their stories during the past 20 days. Numerous people made comments on these blogs showing their commitment to safety. All the blogs have received incredible readership from across the country and across the world. To everyone who shared and or wrote in the blog, I certainly want to take this opportunity to thank you for your, your stories are truly making a difference to help improve traffic safety. I want to take this opportunity to remind you too, we also had an annual poster and video contest for Kansas kids as we wanted to start thinking about traffic safety early on. This year we had 836 kids who entered posters and 37 groups of teens who entered videos and they were all great. You can go out and check out the winners um, now. Um, they're on, on our website, and you can look for um, opportunities about annual activities when we have put the brakes on fatalities. Once again, if you go out and check out now, but then also around August and September of next year um, as we're getting ready for this annual event. So once again, we have some great information on the KDOT website. Several officers are here from the Kansas Highway Patrol, and we want to take the opportunity to thank them for their outstanding partnership on so many of the activities we work on together. Bottom line, we couldn't do it without them. We also have law enforcement officers here from the Topeka Police Department and Shawnee County Sheriff's Office. We work with all of these agencies and many more across the state on safety campaigns throughout the entire year. Thank you for everything you do and for your commitment and dedication to, to help keeping Kansas citizens safe. We certainly recognize law enforcement as a key partner in helping us reduce fatalities on our roadways. And we truly appreciate all your efforts. Our final speaker is going to help us lead us into our senior car fit activity taking place immediately after the news conference. The car fit targets senior drivers, but car fit is for everyone to help them drive safer, longer. Kristen Nichols is an occupational therapist at Avenues Driving. She helps people of all ages resume driving after a medical event. Today we're focused on how to keep older drivers on the road as long as safely possible. 
Please welcome Kristen. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be involved in this event. Um, I have dedicated my career to um, specializing in driver rehabilitation as an occupational therapist. It's a unique niche of our profession, but one that is very important to the safety of all who are out on the roads. As um, a lot of you may be aware that our population of seniors is growing, which has led to a lot of committees and a lot of commitment from folks um, who are here today to participate in trying to make a safer um, scenario for them out on the roads. The population currently is um, in the midst of doubling from 2011 to 2030. It's anticipated that drivers who are 65 and older will increase from 28 million to 56 million in that short span of time. So it is very important that we focus on and try to do our best to provide them with the knowledge and the education on some of the aspects of driving that may be able to benefit them. CarFit is a wonderful uh, program that is a group effort that was put together in 2005 by AAA, AARP, and the American Occupational Therapy Association. It's an educational program that is designed to go over 12 different checkpoints that are um, looking at different aspects of fitting into your vehicle with the advancements in technology as well with vehicles we have found that with some seniors they have had some difficulty trying to um, know how to activate different um, aspects of their car or they um, were unaware that some of those things existed for example um, there are some in some vehicles some pedals that can be moved to be closer to you or further away which can help with things like having better spacing between your um, abdomen and your steering wheel should the airbag go off. The airbag goes off at 200 miles an hour, so as you can imagine, that can cause a lot of damage if it's not properly positioned. Um, we also have a opportunity at the end when um, everyone has had a chance to go through those checkpoints and um, perhaps they've lost a little bit of height over the course of time and are having difficulty seeing over the top of their steering wheel. We have some different gadgets and tools that may be um, beneficial to them and provide education so that they can um, have a better understanding of what sorts of things might be able to benefit them after they leave that event. So um, without further ado, I think that we are set up to um, check out a couple of folks in their vehicles and go through those checkpoints. So thank you again for having me. Thank you, Christian. We do appreciate your hard work and dedication. We are now going to begin our senior car fit event. Once again, car fit is a program for senior drivers that takes a quick and comprehensive review of how we, you and your vehicle work together. Finding how the fit of your vehicle affects your driving and adjusting your vehicle to your changing needs could make a life-saving difference. We do have three people who have volunteered to participate today, so let's all watch and see how it works out. It's just another way we can put the brakes on fatalities. Once again, the, the, I want to emphasize one more point. The driver plays such a huge responsibility in reducing fatalities, not only making sure that everybody in the vehicle is buckled up, but once again, not driving impaired, not driving distracted, obeying the traffic laws. Um, I, I talked about earlier too, 95% of all fatalities, typically the driver made an error, okay? I cannot highlight enough how much responsibility that driver has. Also too, as a passenger, be a good passenger, okay? If they need help navigating somewhere, Take that role as the passenger. Let the driver focus on the number one job of driving and getting everyone to their destination safely. Once again, I want to lead you over here to our uh, car fit event today. Appreciate everybody coming out. Thank you. Okay, what Cindy's doing is she's the meet and greet part of this, and she's going to hand her some brochures, information about what car fit is, how it works, and how she can benefit from it be some waivers with a little sign uh, regarding the event itself, the education information provided during the event, and then also on uh, whether to be recorded or photographed. 
uh, during the event, if we could use them in publication. I'm gonna go through this checklist. Car fit technician will walk the driver through a 12 point checklist. And what the car fit technician is looking for is the driver's ability to do several things at once, which driving has to do. And they're gonna go over features of the car, uh, areas that would help make them a safer driver, whether it's mirror enhancement of kicking the mirrors out, uh, making sure they know where all the uh, features are to help them drive safe in case something happens. Where are the four-way flashers at? Uh, they're not where they used to be in, in a lot of vehicles. Uh, there is a red triangle that's somewhere on the dash instrument cluster that it helps to point out to them because sometimes they just don't know anymore. They don't know that there's pedal assist in their vehicles to bring the pedals out to them so that they don't have to sit up too close to the steering wheel and not give the airbag room to deploy in case there was a crash. So let me know when I disappear. There. Oh, see, now you can turn your head and see me over here. The car would be much bigger. So just that little bit of an adjustment takes a whole lot out of your blind spot. And then we would do the same thing on the other side and make sure also that you can see at your rear view mirror well. We also deal with um, distance from the airbag to their chest. We want that to be more than um, 10 inches, so they've got plenty. And we also want that steering wheel aimed down more at your sternum than at your face. So the, the driver would advance up to the occupational therapy uh, position. They have the 12-point checklist with them. The occupational therapist will go over the 12-point checklist that the technician just did and look for indications that they made where they seen that the driver would need some uh, maybe some direction or some help in this part of the of the process and so that's what Karen our occupational therapist uh, is going to go over with Jim who would be our driver. Uh, Jim you had mentioned that your wife uh, has a little trouble getting in and out of the car yes and there's a very simple solution uh, that she could use with, which would be even taking something like a plastic bag uh, your local grocery store and if she puts that in her in the seat of her car she can swivel more easily and they're also commercially made things like that um, I'm not sure if your wife is having any difficulty with getting in and out of the car with regard to getting her feet in and out uh, it takes her extra time but there are gadgets such as these which is a leg lifter strap um, this is actually a, there's a wire inside and people use something like this not only to get in and out of the car, but some people need to use something like this to get in and out of a bed. Um, so something like that can be helpful. Uh, there are devices um, that can be added to the car so that you have an extra place. Get three point here with me, but something to hook on to this part of the car. So if you need enough extra handhold.